MSC once lived on the streets. Now he's a drummer, playing with the brass band from Espas Masolo. It's an education center for street children in Kinshasa, capital of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Here the children can eat meals and learn to read and write. They also learn to play a musical instrument. The band is a chance for them to escape their misery. I'm here with a group of freelance artists and musicians from Germany. They've come here to create a music theater piece together with children from Espas Masolo. The ambitious project, financed by various German cultural institutions, is slated to go on tour in Germany. But before they can do anything else, they have to get the instruments in shape. Wolfgang Suchner, a musician from Wuppertal, tells me they're badly battered. It doesn't take me long to understand how worlds collide. Wolfgang says the worst thing is when they all play at the same time. It's unbelievably loud, he says. He can't hear them properly, and they can't hear themselves or each other. But he says they are used to it, whereas he, a European musician from Wuppertal, isn't. Nevertheless, it's coming together. We make our way to the theater rehearsals. On the way, Djermessi tells me how he came to live on the street. He says his mother died three years ago. Then his aunt came and said, now that your mother is dead, there's no one to take care of you. You have to take care of yourself. We walk past a burning trash heap. There's no proper trash disposal. I'm shocked at how run down the place is. Director Stefanie Oberhoff tells me the theater piece deals with the origins of the catastrophic conditions in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It goes back to the brutal colonial days and the 30-year terror regime of dictator Joseph Mobutu. Steffi tells me about the problems they have in putting on the show. She says there's no electricity and water is scarce. It's not easy to find a space in which one can concentrate, where there aren't too many people. Here is where the rehearsals are taking place. They let me participate in the warm-ups. I still remember them from the theater club at my school. Lambert Museka says the youngsters learn a lot about their own history from the theater piece. He says if the country hadn't had such a brutal past, the situation today would be different. When they talk about the past, the children understand that their lives are the result of those terrible times. Lambert is Congolese himself, but has lived in Germany for many years. He asks the kids to tell me about the parts they play. Claude says he plays an evil king who robs the land. Dieu says he plays a tribal elder who is driven out by the king. He's my enemy in the play, says Claude, but in real life we're good friends. Few of these young people know their exact ages, let alone their birthdays. But to travel to Germany, the young artists need passports. Kathy Monden, the head of Espace Masolo, simply assigned ages to them. Kathy guessed at Claude's age. Then she gave him a birth date of April 18th. That's her birthday. And now it's his too. <laughs> 
Steffi tells me getting the passports took a heroic effort. Officials, some of whom don't even get paid, had to be bribed, she tells me. So it was a crazy effort to get the things processed. Now all they need are the visas. The youngsters spend their days at Espas Masolo and their nights at a shelter for street children. I ask Dieu Merci to show me where he sleeps, so he takes me home with him. It takes a half an hour to get there by taxi. Normally, he does the whole distance on foot. Dieu Merci shows us his bedroom, which he shares with seven other boys and young men. In the kitchen, he asks Glor what he's cooked for them. Manioc leaves is the answer. It doesn't exactly look like haute cuisine. But then I find out that they prepare meals for 40 children here every day. Dieu tells me they're often sick because the conditions are so dirty. He says it was cleaner back home. My time in DR Congo is almost over. The children have a few more weeks of rehearsal. I'm looking forward to the German premiere, when we'll get to see each other again. Six weeks later, I'm heading to the Frankfurt airport to wait eagerly for the arriving performers. They all made it. It was touch and go, because they only got the visas at the last minute. We take the train to Bochum. There'll be a few more rehearsals there. But before that, they get to have a good night's sleep. The world premiere of King Congo takes place in a former church. I ask Steffi how the rehearsals are going. Very well, she tells me. Now that they're here, they understand more and more about how theater work proceeds. Everyone's astounded at how well it's going. And now it's down to business in a sold-out house, no less. The show presents the story of DR Congo as a fairy tale. The brutal colonial King Leopold II of Belgium has a starring role, as does his kindred spirit in Africa, dictator Mobutu. In this section of the play, Stefanie Oberhof says, your family was locked up, you were sent into the woods, told if you didn't produce enough rubber they'd rape your wife, burn her alive, chop off your children's hands and put your head up a stake? No, I can't translate that. I can hardly believe how good the young actors have become in only a few weeks. It's an auspicious debut for King Congo on tour in Germany.